Hello, how's it going? Um, today I wanted to take a look at the new blue team labs that are up on Hack the Box. They're called Sherlock's and these are a series of compromised machines post-incident um, where you get to go in and do the incident response um, slash forensic investigation and answer a bunch of questions about how the machine got uh, compromised. The one we're looking at today is called Knock Knock and um, all we're given to look at is a packet capture um, for the network uh, for a period of about one to two days. So jumping straight in, um, I've got the scenario and tasks and questions written up here just in a Word document to make things easy. Um, the background here is basically saying that there was a dev server targeted by a threat group, um, it was accidentally left open to the internet and they don't quite know how the compromise took place. Um, we've been given a packet capture and need to answer the following questions. So you can see I've downloaded the packet capture here. It's um, fairly sizable, it's almost uh, 300 megabytes. Um, so let's jump into Wireshark. Let's jump into Wireshark and have a look at what we have. So the first question is about um, the enumeration phase for the attacker. Um, they want to know the time that the attack started and which ports were found open. Um, so to commence this, uh, basically I'm thinking about how port scanning um, automated tools work um, and the sort of common ways of doing that. We've got, um, you know, the, the obvious ones that jump out would be a ping scan or a SYN scan or a full connect scan. Um, so uh, I, I did have a bit of a detailed look, but um, the way forward here is to look for a SYN scan. So what I want to be able to do is look for um, a whole bunch of um, SYN um, flags, basically all in a row where um, some sort of a client out there is going to be hitting a server with um, a whole bunch of um, ports to try and establish open and closed ports. Um, so the first thing I want to do is apply a bit of a filter. Um, so if I have a look at TCP flags sin, um, so I want to see that along with the acknowledge flag being zero. So I'm just looking where um, there are sin, but no, no ACK. So just the sin, not the sin ACK. And I've got, let's see, um, 81,000 packets displayed here. So I'll jump into the statistics and have a look at the conversations to see if there's any one host that might stand out or um, client, sorry, that might stand out um, as having sent a really large number of packets. So if I filter by packets here, um, very quickly, this first line stands out, uh, 3.109.209.43. Um, it's hitting this server, 172.313.946, with 65,638 packets, SYN packets. So that's, um, that's more than the entire um, range of uh, ports um, that are available. So we can pretty well guess that there's been a full um, port sweep uh, of SYN requests from this um, to this. So one of the things Wireshark will allow us to do is apply this conversation as a filter. So I want to see all the conversations between A and B. Cool, so we can see that there's a huge amount of SYN requests and some SYNAX um, and rests, or resets, sorry. Um, so what we want to do now is look for just the successful um, port connections. Um, so if we go back to the first question here, which ports do the attacker find open during their enumeration phase? So we want to have a list of open ports. Um, 
and so at open port res the server will respond with a sin ack so I'm going to look for um, uh, sin and ack flags flags ack and TCP flags sin Okay, and we can see that um, is this in sequence of time? It is now. Um, so we can see port 21 was the first port that was found open, and we can see the server has responded to with our SYN ACK 22, 3306, 6379, etc. etc. Um, to get all of these in sort of an easy to copy and paste um, approach. I ended up adding a column. Um, so if you right click on the table, go to column preferences, and we can add a um, uh, source port. Source port and make that off the TCP source port field. Okay. Just give that a second to reload. And we now have the source port in there. The nice thing about this is we can export um, packet dissections as a CSV. I'll call this, uh, oh, it's taking me to the previous run through. So uh, this one is found ports um, and this just makes it a bit easier to copy and paste so if I open this up in an Excel viewer um, let's filter make sure it's by time now we can see that there's a big jump in time from this point until there's all this communication with the um, port 21. Um, I did actually go back, you can have a look at the, um, the full sequence of events, but um, this 72290, that's roughly the end of when the port scan happens. Um, so it's this list of ports here that make up the, um, the answer to question one okay sorry for the sloppy cut there um i had some issues with the computer anyway i've um, sorted out the the numbers into the format and so we've got the answer to the first one um the next question is about what time the attack started um the port scan counts as the attack I'll go back to um the previous uh query so let's have a look at just the ip address of uh the attacker and the IP address of the server and I'll just go back to the first interactions and we can see that it's a um, request TCP request um, to port 1 and so if I have a look at this particular packet look in the frame information we get the uh, UTC arrival time um, of March 21st, 2023 at 10.42 and 23 seconds. Um, I'm just going to copy that in the format that the question requires and I'll paste it in there and we can move on to the next one. What is the MITRE technique ID of the technique the attacker used to get initial access? Okay, so this is talking about the next step after the port scanning. So uh, we know that there were uh, one, two, three, four, five ports found open. Um, so let's have a look at what the attacker did after they found the open ports. Um, if I just uh, scroll through to see when the port scan finished, we can actually use the time to 
follow the sequence of events here. And um, when I first ran through this challenge, I actually built my own um, very simple timeline and um, and put some timestamps based on these. Uh, I think these are reference, yeah. So it's reference from the first frame and it counts seconds um, from the first frame. And so I could actually use that to uh, sequence out a full timeline of events. What we can see is that at around 72,291, basically, um, the port scan finishes. Um, probably a better way to look at this would be... So I'm just going to set, this is the IP source and this is the IP destination. And just the SYN flag. So this should just show me the port scan. Um, and we can see all of the ports going down um, 65,000 we're getting towards the end here and that's at around 72,290 um, so I'm more or less going to say that uh, 72,290 is the end of the port scan um, and then I can use this to work out what the next steps for the attacker were so by using that time I can go frame dot time relative um, now if you're ever unsure about what um, the filter needs to be um, if you actually go down to the packet itself um, I know that this is the reference time that I want to use and when I hover over the reference time in the window at the very bottom it actually tells me what that field is known as in Wireshark and it says frame dot time underscore relative so I can then use that to um, input into my um, search so I'm going to go 72 291 and I actually want uh, the events that happen after this so greater than And let's see what happens. We might add in the um, IP address of the attacker. And jump up to the start of this. Order up my time. All right, we're seeing the end of the um, port scanning and then a whole bunch of interaction here with port 21 so um, we can assume that the attackers moved on to do something with FTP and um, we can scroll down and just have a look um, at what's going on with the info column here as we scroll down through time um, we're putting requests in with the username trying a whole bunch of sort of standard passwords here small list of standard passwords um, oh, we're trying the same list of passwords with multiple users by the look of it. Okay, those are all the failures. Lonzo, Tony Shepard. Lim Bailey. Okay, so it looks like this is some sort of brute forcing attempt um, on the FTP server. 
So the question that we had was, what's the MITRE ATT&CK technique? Um, if I do a quick Google search, Let's go MITRE technique, root force. So I'll have a look at the brute forcing technique. The question is actually asking for the sub technique. So we can have a look. Um, and this is an example of password spraying, um, which is where you can take a small list of commonly used passwords against many different accounts to attempt to acquire valid credentials. Um, so the correct answer in this instance is that attack technique. Next question, what are the valid set of credentials that used to get an initial foothold? All right, so presumably there was a, um, a valid response. Um, and we can see that, let's find an example, specify a password, the passwords are sent, and then we get the login incorrect. So a successful example um, would be if it came back with a successful response. So let's have a look for if I go FTP dot response dot arg contains successful. So this should only show me the successful login attempts and we have two. I can right click and follow the TCP stream so this automatically applies the filter for the stream in the background here and then shows the content at the top. So we can see that the um, credential set of Tony Shepard and Summer 2023 was the successful logon attempt. And so we can copy them across into here. And then the malicious IP address, that's something we've seen the whole way through. And what is the name of the file which contains some config data and credentials? So the next thing I probably want to do um, is follow this stream all the way through. So if I follow the TCP stream, I should see the entire conversation um, after the successful log into FTP, um, but this doesn't seem to have it. Um, let's just jump back to a previous query. Maybe try the second one. Okay, and um, we can see the entire stream or conversation. Um, so we got successful login um, extended passive mode, having a look, directory listing, getting a size for a dot backup file, retrieve, which is a, a get downloading the backup file. Um, same for a fetch.sh. So with passive mode um, and a binary mode data connection, um, this here actually represents the port over which the binary data will be transferred. Um, so you can't see the data in this stream here, but what we can do is leave this open and um, have a look at this port here, which is 7831. So if we filter by Seven eight three one. We should be able to see the data for this backup. Uh, sorry, no, it's the eleven three six five is when we retrieve the backup. So eleven three six five.
and we'll see this um, this backup being sent if we follow this stream and there we go I've got it set to represent the data as ASCII um, and we can see it's some sort of configuration file we can see that there are backup server credentials here and this um, FTP internal configuration thing um, actually becomes quite significant and the uh, the root and origin of the name knock knock for this particular challenge um, so before we get into that let's just save this as a file so we're going to grab that as uh, a backup of dot backup so I'll save that and I just want to grab the fetch.sh as well while we're in here and that's going to be port 63669 and there we have it I'll save this as well And that seems to have the, um, uh, it's a bash script and it's got a database connection string and it's got the uh, credentials right there as well. Okay, so um, I'll take a quick look at this point at the, um, the backup file again. All right, so we can see that there is this configuration set up. Um, this is actually an example of a script on the server which will allow for um, a technique called port knocking. And port knocking is um, a way of uh, granting access to the server um, by uh, sending a a connection request to a sequence of, of ports that's um, meant to be kept a secret and that will then allow uh, that IP address onto the server. So the sequence in this instance is to try and connect to port 29999, then 50234, then 45087 within a five second period. And what that'll do is put an IP tables rule, which is uh, effectively a, a firewall rule, um, which will set the IP address that you've just connected to those ports with um, and will accept connections from that IP address for uh, allow connections from that IP address for port 24456. Um, so that's called port knocking. Um, and this is uh, the um, method by which the, uh, the attacker ends up getting access to the uh, internal FTP server. Right, so let's have a quick look at the questions at this stage. So what's the name of the file uh, which contains some config data and credentials? Um, so that's obviously the dot .backup. Uh, which port is the critical service running on? Um, I'm assuming they're talking about the FTP internal, and that means it is going to be uh, 24,456. And what is the name of the technique used to get to that critical service? Port knocking. Which ports were required to interact with to reach the critical service? Um, in this instance, we need to provide these ports and uh, I think the actual answer requires them to be in uh, numerical order or correct sequence, so um, you might have to change that. And what is the UTC time when interaction with the previous question ports ended? All right, so let's grab this particular port and we can have a look at when the attacker did that. So let's have a look at um, my IP address here. TCP port is that. 
So we should really only see a um, hit from when they did the port scan, which was this one, if you look at the time, and then another attempt a fair bit later on. And so let's grab the and the UTC time. March 21, 10.58.50. And I've got that in the correct format on my clipboard. I'll paste them there. What are the set of valid credentials for the critical service? Uh, once again, that was within the document for the other backup server. This is the correct answer. So these credentials get onto the internal service. We can also validate that. Um, so if we go to the port 24456 and right, for some reason tried to log on with the wrong credentials first and then if we follow the next stream, we can confirm that these were the credentials that we used to successfully log on to that internal uh, server. So that's another way to confirm that question. At what UTC time did the attacker get access to the critical server? Um, and we are pretty well onto that right now. So presumably they are talking about the time at which the login was successful. So I'll grab this and the frame time on this one was at 11 and one, one second, almost 11 on the dot. So we can put that one in there. Once again, got that on my clipboard in the correct format. And then there's a whole series of questions which relate to the activity that happens in this next stage. So let's um, jump on and have a look what the attacker did with access to this internal FTP server. Um, once again, we can go in and actually grab the information that the um, attacker got over the um, over this connection and um, and follow the whole sequence of, uh, of events that happened here um, to a very high level run through uh, it's it's a fairly basic uh, enumeration going on from the um, attacker here they're using list commands to list uh, the contents of various directories grabbing documents as they go um, uh, tasks to get done, dot doc, reminder texts, um, changing the current working directory, figuring out where they are, present working directory, uh, jumping around a little bit, they grab um, Etsy past WD file, they try and grab the Etsy shadow file, um, but they get um, a failure 550 fail to open. go to root, but they can't go there, um, have a look in bin, don't find anything, um, have a look in opt, where they go to reminders and find a dot reminder file, have a look in proc, CPU info, share, bin, SBIN, and that's pretty much it. So let's grab the files that were exfiltrated so we know what the attacker had access to. And in order to do that, I'm going to do the same process I used for the last one, where I find the data stream port that was used. And uh, save the data. Okay, follow the stream. Great, it's a MySQL dump. That's fine in ASCII, so I'm going to save that as the uh, SQL dump. 
the text. Um, all right, we can see that it's got AWS uh, EC2. It's got some credentials in there. Um, so it's got name, account ID, password. There we go. Alonzo, account ID, no passwords. Null, null password, and then Abdullah ID password. So they've got some AWS credentials from that bit of information. The next thing the attacker got was this tasks to get done document. Now with uh, Word documents and some document formats, uh, we may have to change the um, the way the data's encoded before we save it for it to work properly. So uh, let's have a look. Yeah, so um, we're going to want, instead of it uh, doing a conversion, Wireshark doing the conversion for us to try and show this as ASCII characters, um, I'm gonna put this back to the raw uh, bytes, uh, hex I suppose, and, um, and save the document in this format so that it will uh, It'll be read properly, so I can call this tasks.docx. And let's just make sure that's worked properly. Yep, there we go. That's just got a table in there with a list of tasks, including moving the AWS on prem should have been finished in January, so presumably that's already happened. And what was next? Task to get done, then we have this reminder. Reminder is just a .txt, so I'll put this back to whoop, ASCII format. Uh, nice and easy. Uh, just looks like a reminder um, to the server admin or uh, talking about the CEO's arrival with a date. Um, I'll save it. And I think there was just one more document. Nope, there was two. So there's the Etsy past WD. Grab that one. All right, so we can see users on the system or users that have um, a shell. Um, so I'm going to save that as well. I'll call it .txt so it opens properly. And then there should just be one more. Uh, that's right, in the ops reminders directory, uh, there's a dot .reminder file. Reminder to clean up GitHub repo. Some sensitive data could have been leaked there. Okay, so I'll save that as well. And it looks like I'll be looking for a GitHub repo. Um, I'll just call it Reminder 2. Okay, so let's have a quick look back at the questions at this point. And what's the AWS account ID for the developer Abdullah? Um, so let's jump back into those folders that we just found. Um, 
was in the sequel dump, I think. Yep. Abdullah, and we want the account ID and password. There we go. And deadline for hiring developers. I think that was one of the actions in this document. Hire 20 developers. Oh, 30th of August, uh, 2023. When did the CEO arrive? Uh, that was back on the reminder. He used to arrive in my city 8th of March. Cool. So I'll plug that one in. The attacker was able to perform div directory traversal and escape the CH root jail. This caused the attacker to roam around the file system just like a normal user would. What's the username of an account other than root having bin bash set as the default shell? Um, so we can see users and default shells from Etsy past WD. And the, there are only three with bin bash. There's Cyber Junkie, um, Ubuntu and root. So in this instance, I believe it's Cyber Junkie. And the full path of the file which led to SSH access of the server by the attacker. Uh, it's asking for the SSH password which the attacker used to access the server and get full access. Not sure we have that one either and full URL where the attacker downloaded ransomware. So this is all um, um, post-exploitation or activity. So we're not quite there with any of that. Um, I did actually get stuck here for a little while, but um, going back to this um, rather cryptic reminder um, about cleaning up the GitHub repo, that was really the only loose thread um, that we hadn't followed. Um, and that led me on to the next uh, stage of solving this challenge. So the way forward is actually a bit of open source uh, intelligence gathering. You could just do some basic uh, Google dorking, but um, I went straight to GitHub um, if I could spell. <laughs> and looked for the company name for our uh, development. Uh, didn't get any matches there. Just look for Pharrella. Have I spelled that correctly? Pharrella, that's one L. I think it was development repo. Here we go. Forella Finance, Forella Dev from March 21. And we can see that it's been created by Cyber Junkie, so it looks pretty promising. Currently, testing phase go live once Office in Lahore is open. So let's have a look at this. And it's a YAML file which seems to be. Um, connecting via SSH, um, downloading a SSH key from a URL, logging in and then performing some actions. Um, let's have a look at the commit history here. Ah, there we go. So there's a commit history where the um, password at one point was hard coded. Um, it's been fixed, but they didn't clean up the um, commit uh, history, so I'm still able to find it. And I believe that was one of the questions, what's the SSH password? There we go. So that's the answer to that one, and the full path of the file which led to SSH access. Um, so that's referring to the reminder here about the GitHub repo uh, with sensitive information being leaked. A little bit cryptic there, but um, if we go back, we can see that that was uh, dot reminder, which is in reminders and opt directory. 
And moving on to the final three. Uh, what's the full URL where the attacker downloaded ransomware? So now we're moving to post access um, and exploitation. So let's jump back into Wireshark. Um, this was another example of a time where pulling together a bit of a timeline uh, was actually super useful. So as I was walk working through this um, this exercise, I built up a reasonable idea about where the um, where the key points in time were. Um, as I went through, I took some notes. So um, you can see the port scanning, the brute forcing, successful login. Um, the external FTP login <laughs> and the time they spent on there. Um, at what point in time they found the details for the internal FTP. Um, when they were on the internal. And then um, this one is, uh, is where we're up to. But uh, at this point I had up to this timestamp here, the 73966. And uh, I was able to use that to pretty quickly um, figure out what happened next. So given that the attacker uh, has at this point SSH'd into the server, I want to use the server ID, uh, server ID, server um, IP address. And I want to see uh, frame time relative after that SSH login. Um, the question was what was the full URL where the attack downloaded ransomware? So I am also going to have a look just for HTTP protocol. All right, and this stands out ransomware. So if I follow this, there we go. So we've got the request URI. Let's have a look at the packet that was sent. And I can just grab the uh, copy copy value and put that straight in as the full URL uh, what tool and version was used to download the ransomware so if I go back to the HTTP stream you can see the get request was sent this was the host and the user agent is wget uh, 1212 which is the tool And finally, the ransomware name. Um, I ended up just surfing through the um, the zip file to try and find some plain text. I could have downloaded it and run strings against it or some other method, but um, after a bit of hunting through... Ah, there it is. Um, you can see a reference to the server, source, gonna cry um, and gonna cry utils um, which is obviously a play on the very famous wanna cry so the answer here is gonna cry that'll about do it um, thanks for watching hope you enjoyed and uh, as always if you've got any questions or comments or suggestions for future videos uh, please let me know send me a message leave a comment below and look forward to talking to you again in the next one